Welcome to lecture number two of Bio 102, uh, general bio Principles of General Biology in uh, John Tyler Community College. My name is Mr. Sparks and I will be your instructor for this lecture. Today we're going to study chapter 20, Phylogeny. Uh, phylogeny is our understanding of the relationship of species of organisms to one another and uh, throughout their evolutionary history. This is the overview, investigating the evolutionary history of life. Legless lizards and snakes are very similar in appearance, yet they've evolved from different lineages of lizards with legs. Legless lizards have evolved independently in several different groups, although adapta through adaptations to similar environments. Here's an example of a glass lizard or legless lizard. Uh, it looks very similar to a snake, but it's actually um, uh, morphologically uh, slightly different. Um, the head is more like a lizard's head, and it's, uh, it lacks the movable scutes or scales on the underside, which all snakes have. Instead, it just kind of wriggles its way through the bushes. You can find these in uh, North Carolina on the or on Virginia on the coastal dune areas as is seen here in its native habitat. Um, so here we look at the characteristics uh, for, uh, to understand the phylogeny of the eastern glass lizard. It's, uh, we can tell that it's more recently evolved than the snakes, although both s snakes and glass lizards have no legs, they are <clears throat> evolved separately. They have uh, uh, traits which are similar, but they have different uh, origins for those traits. Phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or group of related species. The discipline of systematics classifies organisms and determines their evolutionary relationships. So systematics is um, like taxonomy, the way that we name things. Uh, and through that naming of those organisms, we begin to understand their evolutionary relationships. Taxonomy is the ordered division and naming of organisms. Um, this is where you get, uh, well, we'll describe it here in the lecture. In the 18th century, Carolus Linnaeus published a system of taxonomy based on resemblances, on morphological resemblances. The two key features of his system remain useful today. The two-part name uh, for species and the hierarchical classification. With this hierarchical classification, uh, Linnaeus um, began to understand uh, evolutionary relationships. In fact, it was during his time he wanted to uh, put the great apes and the humans in the same category but he was unable to do so because um, he of trepidation, of fear from uh, backlash from the church. So instead of lumping them together, he, he, mo he moved them separately. But today we use Linnaean classification to understand that uh, humans are great apes. We're in the same clade, in the same phylogenetic group. The two-part scientific name of a species is called the binomial, hence the term binomial nomenclature. The first part of the name is the genus. The second part is called the specific epithet. It's the unique for each species within the genus. So for human beings, we are Homo sapiens, and there is also a, a closely related species that is now extinct known as Homo neanderthalensis. So we share the same genus as them, but we are designated as a different distinct species. The first letter of the genus is capitalized, and the entire species name is italicized or underlined. Both parts together name the species, not the specific epithet set alone. So you can't just say sapiens, you have to say homo sapiens. Linnaeus introduced a system for grouping species in increasingly broad categories. The taxonomic groups from narrow to broad are species, 
genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. Now, one way you can remember this is in reverse order, um, you can use the, the mnemonic device, King Philip cried out for good soup. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And the domain is the, the super order that um, uh, we're going to talk about later. That includes the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Okay, so here is an example of the species uh, Panthera pardus, which is the um, African leopard. The genus is Panthera. The family is Felidae. That includes all the cats, including house cats. Uh, Panthera includes all the, all the um, large cats, the big cats. Uh, the order Carnivora, that includes everything from weasels and minks and skunks and raccoons and uh, cats and um, dogs and any of the carnivores. Um, in the class mammalia, of course, mammalia includes any organism that has hair and nurses its young. So this includes the placental mammals and the uh, marsupials. Okay, also the phylum chordata, that's anything uh, with, a, with a chordate, um, <clears throat> anything with a backbone. And this is a much uh, broader category. It includes everything in that phylum chordata. We're going to discuss that um, l uh, at length later. Uh, kingdom animalia is the kingdom that, the, uh, that this group falls in. And the domain is eukarya, or the eukaryotes. Everyone knows what a eukaryote is, correct? That is the, um, uh, a cell or cellular organism that has a nuclear membrane or cellular membranes as distinct from the prokaryotes, which include the bacteria and the archaea. A taxonomic unit at any level of hierarchy is called a taxon. So a species is a certain taxon, and a phylum is a certain taxon. The broader taxon are not comparable between lineages. For example, an order of snails has less genetic diversity than an order of mammals. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Systematist depict evolutionary relationships in branching phylogenetic trees. Okay, the phylogenetic tree is how we understand these evolutionary relationships in a picture form. Here's a phylogenetic tree of uh, carnivores. Okay, these are all the order carnivora, the family, uh, there's three different families represented here, uh, Felidae, Mustelidae, and Canidae. Uh, okay, Canis, Canidae is all of the dogs, uh, Canis lupus and Canis latrans, and this would also include the domestic dogs, Canis familiaris, that everybody uh, is familiar with, Canis familiaris. Um, the, the Felidae includes the um, large cats, pan, the uh, genus Panthera, <coughs> which includes uh, Panthera leo, the lion, uh, Panthera onca, the jaguar, um, Panthera tigris, the tiger. Uh, all these are, um, re are in that genus Panthera. And then the species is the most specific, okay, species is the specific term for each of these organisms. The leopard, the American badger, oh, I wasn't finished there. The, the um, otter, European otter, um, the coyote, the gray wolf, those are all common names. And so these common names have to be further distinguished using the specific epithet. 
because uh, Lutra Lutra is the European otter, and it's not to be confused with Lutra canadensis, which is the North American otter. Linnaean classification and phylogeny can differ from each other. Systematists have proposed that classification be based entirely on uh, evolutionary relationships, and this is the prevailing view at the time. A, a phylogenetic tree represents a hypothesis about evolutionary relationships. Each branch represents a divergence of two taxa from a common ancestor. So where they join, that branch point represents the common ancestor. Sister taxa are groups that share an immediate common ancestor. A rooted tree includes a branch that to represent all the most recent common ancestor of all taxa in that tree. It could be considered a clade. We'll talk about clades in a little bit. A basal taxon diverges early in the history of the group and originates near the common ancestor of the group. A polytomy is a branch from which one or more, from which more than two groups emerge. Okay, so here is the uh, ancestral lineage. That's the base. Um, this first branch point represents the common ancestor to taxes um, A through G. Okay, all these share a common ancestor here. Uh, the branch point where the lineages di diverge, this shows these different taxon here. Um, this branch here, uh, number five, is a... Um, a polytomy, it's an unresolved pattern of divergence. This means that systematists are not yet certain as to the relationships here. So what they put in there in instead of a dichotomy is uh, a, a polytomy. We can learn, we can and cannot learn from what we can and cannot learn from phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees show patterns of descent, not phenotypic sim similarity. Phylogenetic trees do not generally indicate when a species evolved or how much change occurred in that lineage. It should not be assumed that a taxon evolved from a, the taxon next to it. So phylogenetic trees are very uh, general tools. Uh, they're distinct from cladograms, which I think we'll talk about, which show more um, detail about the, um, uh, the uh, phylogenetic history, the evolutionary history. Phylogeny provides important information about similar characteristics in closely related species. Phylogenetic trees based on DNA sequences can be used to infer their species identities. For example, a phylogeny was used to identify the species of whale from which whale meat was uh, originated. Okay, so here we used uh, genetic markers uh, to determine what species of whale these whale, mate, these whale meat came from. This is important because some of these whales are protected and others of these whales are not. Um, so some are open to being hunted and others are not. So here are the um, unknown, uh, unknown whales. Well, they're more similarly related to the minke whale, so we think it must be a minke whale. Unknown 1B, uh, similar to a humpback whale. And unknown 10, 11, 12, and 13 are closely related to the um, fin whale. To infer, phylogenies are inferred from morphological and molecular data. To infer phylogeny, systematists gather information about morphologies, genes, and biochemistry of living organisms. The similarities used to infer the phylogenies must result from shared ancestry. Morphological and molecular homologies. Phenotypic and genetic similarities due to shared ancestry are called homologies. Organisms with similar morphologies or DNA sequences are likely to be more closely related 
than organisms with different structures or sequences. When constructing a phylogeny, systematists need to distinguish whether a similarity is the result of a homology or an analogy. A homology is similarity due to shared ancestry, but an analogy is similarity due to convergent evolution. We talked a little bit about convergent evolution in the first lecture. Remember, we looked at the, um, at the uh, sugar glider and the flying squirrel. Convergent evolution occurs when similar environmental pressures and natural selection produce similar or analogous adaptations in organisms from different evolutionary lineages. Here we see on the, on the top the Australian marsupial mole. And at the bottom here you can see the um, <clears throat> North American mole. Now they're very uh, morphologically similar. They both have their front feet are paddle shaped and have large claws to aid in digging and their noses are covered with uh, hard skin to help them burrow through the soil and they both have uh, small hind legs and they both feed on uh, insects and worms in the in the soil. But the one on top is the marsupial mole from Australia. And the one on bottom is the placental mole from North America. They evolved uh, separately from different, uh, from different ancestral organisms, so they do not have common ancestry. Their traits are analogous, and this is an example of convergent evolution. Bat and bird wings are homologous as forelimbs, but as analogous as functional wings. Analogous structures or molecular sequences that evolved independently are also called homoplasies. Homology can be distinguished from analogy by comparing fossil evidence and the degree of complexity. The more complex two, two similar structures are, the more likely it is that they are homologous. Evaluating molecular homologies. Molecular homologies are determined based on the degree of similarity and, dis and nucleotide sequence between taxa. Systematists use computer programs when analyzing comparable DNA segments from different organisms. Okay, so here we show two, two separate organisms. Uh, we're comparing their DNA. Their DNA is obviously very similar. But over time, the uh, mutations may occur to those different organisms. Some may have uh, deletions of, those, of the DNA. Remember, you learned about this in Bio 101. Uh, and some may have insertions of different uh, nucleotides into their, into their um, nucleotide sequence. And so this causes them to appear, the, the differences become obscured. But we can see these differences if we look at them. Usually they use a computer program to do this. This is a very simplified model. Uh, so we can see here's the, uh, the insertion here, and here's the, the deletion, uh, which was present right here. So when we compare these two uh, DNA sequences, um, we are able to uh, identify uh, where they are similar. Okay, so here we are, oh, here we are, uh, similar, uh, the similar DNA. Okay, so shared bases and nucleotide sequences are otherwise very dissimilar, are called molecular homoplasies. These are uh, similar traits that have been uh, made dissimilar over time. Okay, so here are... Um, here are uh, here's a molecular homoplasy or a nucleotide homoplasy. Uh, here you can see the the nucleotides that are the same here, whereas the rest of the nucleotide has changed over time. So that's molecular homoplasy. Once homologous characters have been identified, they can be used to infer phylogeny. 
So the same homologous characters refers to both morphological characteristics, shape of the phenotype of the organism, and also uh, the molecular uh, characters of the organism. Cladistics is the, uh, uh, is the discipline which seeks to understand um, uh, organisms by virtue of common descent. So cladistics classifies organisms by common descent. A clade is a group of species that includes an ancestral species and all its descendants. Clades can be nested in larger clades, but not all groupings of organisms qualify as clades. Let's take a look at this a little closer. A valid clade is monophyletic, signifying that it consists of the ancestor species and all of its descendants. Here we show a monophyletic clade here. That shows the one common ancestor and all these uh, um, offspring related uh, species. Uh, here's a paraphyletic a clade, a paraphyletic group. It's not a clade. Um, this paraphyletic group includes, um, it may for reasons of morphological or molecular uh, similarities, it may include, you may be looking at these species, but it doesn't include this final species here, and so um, it is not a clade. And this is a polyphyletic group, and this includes um, a whole um, a, a sections of, uh, of organisms from uh, unrelated clades. Okay, so basically a monophyletic group is the clade. So anywhere where you have a common ancestor that includes all of those uh, related organisms, that is a clade. Here's the monophyletic clade. A paraphyletic grouping includes, con includes uh, an ancestral species and some but not all of the, spe of the descendants. So here we have the paraphyletic group. A polyphyletic grouping consists of various taxa with different ancestors. Okay, here are various taxa with having different ancestors. In comparison with its ancestor, an organism is both shared with is both shared and different characteristics. A shared ancestral character is a character that is originated in an ancestor of the taxon. A shared derived character is an evolutionary novelty unique to a particular clade. So, um, <clears throat> when you look at all the cetaceans, which all share a uh, common ancestor, some are toothed whales and some are baleen whales. The baleen trait is a there's a shared derived character of all the baleen whales. Fin whales, minke whales, blue whales, humpback whales, they all share that same derived character. A character can be both ancestral and derived, depending on the context. When inferring evolutionary relationships, it is useful to know in which clade a shared derived character first appeared. Okay, so here we look at, um, we're able to piece together the evolutionary relationships of these organisms based on these characters. Okay, all, of, all these organisms have a backbone except for the lancelet. That's the uh, primitive chordate. It does have a notochord, but it does not have a, a backbone, a vertebral common. Uh, everything else here does. Lamprey, base, frog, turtle, leopard. Okay, and they all share the, um, they either share or do not share these traits. Hinge jaws, okay, lamprey does not have that. Um, walking on four legs, tetrapods, um, the fish, the bass does not have that. The frog, turtle, and the leopard do. Amniotic sac uh, in the placenta, um, the turtle eggs have those, and as do mammals. And then hair, the final derived characteristic, is only shared by the leopards. So we use those derived characteristics to build the phylogenetic tree. 
And here is the final genetic tree that, that we see here. Here are the characteristics. Vertebral column, hinge jaws, walking legs, four walking legs, um, amnion hair. Okay, here is the character table, more closely aligned. You can uh, look at this in your textbook. It's on uh, page uh, 388. Uh, an outgroup is a species or a group of species that is closely related uh, to the in-group, the various species being studied. An outgroup is a group that has diverged before the in-group. So we have to know something about the systematics of the group before we can identify an outgroup. Systematists compare each in-group species with the outgroup to differentiate between shared and derived and shared ancestral characteristics. Characters shared by the outgroup and in-group are ancestral characters that predate the divergence of both groups from a common ancestor. Phylogenetic trees with proportional branch lengths. In some trees, the length of a branch can reflect the number of genetic changes that have take place in, in the particular DNA sequence in that lineage. Okay, so here we can see that there's a very small difference between humans and mice as indicated by the uh, short uh, phylogenetic branches here, whereas the outgroup here, Drosophila, is, uh, it is an animal, but it's an invertebrate. It's very distinct from the rest of these species, and it's, it, it's evolved uh, very much earlier than any of these other species here. Lancelet, more primitive, zebra fish, frog, chicken, human, mouse. Humans and mice are both mammals, so we would expect that they would be more closely related. And according to these, the length of these phylogenetic branches, uh, we can tell that they are. In other trees, branch length can represent chronological time, and branching points can be determined from the fossil record. Okay, so here we look at the... These similar data here, same uh, species, and we're looking at them over uh, millions of years. We use uh, molecular clocks in order to try to determine the, the distance here. We're going to talk about molecular clocks later on in this lecture, but uh, here are the um, primitive periods, Paleozoic period, this is the ancient time period, Mesozoic, um, this is a more recent time. Uh, age of the this is Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and age of the dinosaurs, and then Cenozoic, 65 million years ago. What happened then? That was the massive asteroid collision that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and brought on the recent age, the Cenozoic, which means recent age, and that is when um, ma uh, mammals first began to uh, radiate. Systematists can never be sure of finding the best tree in a large data set. They narrow the possibilities by applying the concept of maximum parsimony, and they use um, powerful computers to try to uh, determine this information. Maximum parsimony assumes that the tree that requires the fewest evolutionary events, appearances of sh shared derived characters, is the most likely. Computer programs are used to search for trees that are parsimonious. Now here's an example of applying parsimony to a problem in molecular systematics. Um, uh, basically, I'll go through this very quickly. If you want to know more about this, it's on page 390 in your textbook. Um, here we look at the uh, a given trait and how it's uh, different to uh, these different possible phylogenetic trees. There are three phylogenetic hypotheses here, and then we test them, and we look at um, the rate of, uh, or the types of changes that are occurring uh, in those phylogenetic trees, and the one that is simplest is the one that we use. So this is the tree that has only six events. It's simpler than those that have seven events, the other two, each have seven events, and the one that only has six events is the, is the most parsimonious. That's the one we use to understand 
the relationship of the tree. So these species here, species one, two, and three, um, are related in this way. Species one and two are more closely related, and species three is, um, is uh, probably more primitive and um, uh, more distantly related to the other two. The best hypotheses for phylogenetic trees fit the most data. Morphological data, molecular data, and fossil data. We try to look at all three of those groups in order to determine phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic hypotheses are modified when new evidence arises. And this does happen not infrequently. Um, uh, the, um, in each discipline of uh, biology, there are boards of taxonomists and when a new species is discovered or a species that is known is discovered to be a crypto species a species um, that was that was um, hidden in plain sight if you will um, they can uh, determine that it has a new name a new taxonomy and that will change the phylogenetic inferences um, as that new evidence arises Phylogenetic bracketing allows us to predict features of ancestors and their extinct descendants based on features of closely related living descendants. For example, phylogenetic bracketing allows us to infer characteristics of dinosaurs based on shared characteristics in modern birds and crocodiles. So let's take a look at this. Okay, here's a phylogenetic tree that shows the common, most common recent uh, ancestor of crocodilians and dinosaurs. So, um, dinosaurs are no longer alive, so it would be accurate to say that the, the most closely related living relative of birds is crocodiles. Birds and crocodiles share several features, four chambered hearts, they have a song. I don't know if you've ever heard of alligators bellow, but crocodilians bellow to protect their nests. They build nests and they brood their young. They take care of their young after the young is hatched until the young is old enough to go on to its own. So these characteristics likely evolved in a common ancestor and were shared by all of its descendants, including the dinosaurs. And fossil records supports nest building and brooding in dinosaurs. Okay, here's a dwarf crocodile. It's, it's uh, sitting on top of its nest, this little hump of earth underneath it here. Uh, it's um, guarding its eggs until they hatch, and when they do hatch, the crocodile, the dwarf crocodile, will um, take care of those um, offspring and guard them from predators. Okay, here's fossil evidence of uh, a dinosaur, an oviraptor, which is guarding its age, eggs. It was killed by perhaps a volcanic eruption that laid down ash and killed the oviraptor as it was sitting on its eggs. So we have direct evidence of the oviraptor uh, sitting on its eggs. Molecular clocks help us to track evolutionary time. To extend molecular phylogenies beyond the fossil record, we must make an assumption about how molecular clocks change, how mo molecular change occurs over time. So if we can find a gene that seems to have a steady rate of mutation, then we can make inferences about molecular time. A molecular clock uses constant rates of evolution. And some genes, in some genes, to estimate the absolute time of evolutionary change. The number of nucleotide substitutions in related genes can be assumed to be proportional to the time since they last shared a common ancestor. Molecular clocks are calibrated by plotting the number of genetic changes against the dates of, of branch points known from the fossil record. Individual genes vary in how clock-like they are. Some are more dependable than others. Okay, so here's an example. A number of mutations occurring over time 
we correlate this on a scatter plot and we look at the divergence time in millions of years. Okay, we can extract uh, DNA from uh, uh, certain fossils and then uh, interpret um, their relationship over time. So, oh, so what this means is that closer, closer to the time zero, they're more closely related and closer to the time 120 million years there there are more genetic more genetic uh, mutations and the organisms are uh, more differently related some mutations are selected selectively neutral and have little or no effect on fitness neutral mutation mutations should be regular like a clock a neutral mutation is dependent on how the critical the gene's amino acid sequence is to survival. Molecular clocks do not run as smoothly as expected if mutations were selectively neutral. Irregularities result from natural selection in which some DNA changes are favored over others. Estimates of evolutionary divergences older than the fossil record have a high degree of uncertainty. The use of multiple genes may improve estimates. Phylogenetic analysis shows that HID, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is descended from viruses that infect chimpanzees and other primates. HIV spread to humans more than once. A comparison of HIV samples shows that the virus evolved in a very clock-like way. Application of the molecular clock to one strain of HIV suggests that that strain spread to humans as early as the 1930s. So here we look at the scatter plot here of the known uh, differences in, um, in uh, base pair changes uh, of the HIV gene sequence, and then we can extrapolate that using a scatter plot. Um, uh, we run a a line down to see uh, when that uh, species or when that uh, uh, original change occurred. Okay, recently uh, new information continues to revise our understanding of evolutionary history. Recently, systematists have gained insight into the very deepest branches of the tree of life through the analysis of DNA sequence data. Early taxonomists classified all species as either plants or animals. Later, five kingdoms were recognized, Monera, Protista, Plantae, Fungi, and Animalia. More recently, the three domain system has been adopted, Bacteria, Archaea, and Eukarya. The three domain system is supported by data from many sequence genomes. Okay, so here are the three domains. The domain Eukarya includes all of the protists here, foraminiferas, diatoms, ciliates, red algae, green algae. Uh, land plants are closely related to the green algae, as we'll see later in the course. Amoebas, fungi, and animals are very closely related, more closely related than they are to uh, some other protists. Um, the domain Archaea includes the um, extremophiles, the methanogens and thermophiles, and the halophiles, um, and the domain Bacteria, which includes all the bacteria that we're familiar with. Proteobacteria, uh, mitochondria believed to evolve as, as a bacteria originally, um, chlamydias, spirochetes, gram-positive bacteria, cyanobacteria, and chloroplasts also believed to have evolved as a uh, bacteria. Three domain system highlights the importance of single-celled organisms in the, in the history of life. Domains bacteria and archaea are single-celled are prokaryotes. 
only three lineages in the domain Archaea are do dominated by the multicellular organisms. Kingdoms Plantae, Fungi, and Animalia. Everything else is single-celled. The important root of horizontal role of horizontal gene transfer. The tree of life suggests that eukaryotes and archaea are more closely related to each other than, back, than they are to bacteria. The tree of life is based largely on ribosomal RNA genes, which have evolved slowly, allowing detection of homologies between distantly related organisms. Other genes indicate different evolutionary relationships. There have been substantial interchanges of genes between organisms in different domains. Horizontal gene transfer is the movement of genes from one genome to another, generally among bacteria or archaea. Horizontal gene transfer occurs by exchange of transposable elements and plasmids, viral infection, and fusion of organisms. Horizontal gene transfer complicates efforts to build the tree of life. So where it was, once seemed pretty similar, we, uh, pretty easy to look at the um, three domains, now we have to look at more complicated relationships because of horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer may have been common enough that in the early history of life, it is better depicted at, by a tangled web than by a branching tree. So here we go. Here is a, a schematic that shows us more about horizontal gene transfer. So here you can see, let's just focus on the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. The mitochondria and the chloroplasts originated as bacteria and then they were uh, subsumed uh, by the plants and animals and fungi by um, virtue of uh, endosymbiosis, a process that we're going to look at in, the, in uh, another chapter. Okay, so um, you can see here that like uh, uh, this, all these relationships are, are not as, uh, there, there are genes that are going back and forth uh, between the bacteria and the archaea and uh, uh, <clears throat> organelles that like the chloroplast and the con mitochondria that originated first in the ba as bacteria and then were transferred to the uh, domain eukarya. Oh, okay, here's some random phylogenetic trees. Uh, here are uh, tetrapods, which actually includes snakes. Snakes are not don't have legs, but they lost their legs through evolutionary time. Originally, they did have time uh, legs. Um, tetrapods are four-legged animals. Um, uh, Dimetrodon is a uh, a primitive reptile related to a cyanodont, which uh, are closely related to mammals giving rise to our own lineage. Okay, here is, um, here this shows uh, relationships of uh, various bears. Um, brown bears and polar bears are more recently evolved. Um, uh, giant panda bears are more distantly related to other bears than the others are. Um, all of these points here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all represent uh, uh, the common ancestors of those organisms. And these are all um, uh, divided into nice dichotomies. So they're not, uh, um, they're not, um, they're, they're clearly resolved. These are understood phylogenetic traits. Okay, so here's the, here's the um, tree to review. Uh, phylogenetic tree. This shows the most common recent an ancestor. Uh, these are the branch points here. Those are the common recent ancestors. And there's the polytomy. These are unresolved, um, <clears throat> unresolved um, uh, taxons. Okay, monophyletic groups, paraphyletic groups, polyphyletic groups. Basically the most important thing here is the monophyletic group. 
because that is the basis of the clade. And the clade is used to describe all those uh, organisms that are related um, by common ancestry. Okay, um, here's a character table. Uh, shows uh, this is this is what they look like. Um, um, just shows uh, all right. Um, backbone, hinged limb, hinged jaw, four limbs, amnion, milk, and have a dorsal or back fin. And only the uh, well, the the tuna and the dolphin share that trait, but they're not. Related. Although adult dolphins have only two obvious limbs, their flippers, as embryos, they have a two hind limb buds and a total of four limbs. 